hello everybody uh today we do not have chris short so uh as a result we're having all kinds of challenges as you might have uh, noticed um but today i have with us some uh, pretty special guests um somebody's uh running uh, the twitch channel with the live sound um but today uh andrew uh do you want to introduce yourself as my uh, as my guest co-host yeah although you can't blame issues on the lack of chris short that's that's not oh. that's not fair oh. Yeah, well, you'll see in the slides how I further, <laughs> him, so not to worry. Um, yeah, yeah so, so hello, everyone. Uh, I am Andrew Sullivan, Technical Marketing Manager, uh, peer of Langdon. Uh, I also host a show that uh, is happening today at 11 a.m. Uh, so with Chris being out today, taking a well-needed day to rest and do his thing, uh, and Langdon and I are joining each other's shows as, as co-hosts, so... Uh, look forward to seeing um, Langdon on my show later and being a participant here, um, although I admit I am not a developer by any stretch of anyone's imagination. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to learn an awful lot here. Nice. All right. So uh, to make the show even more fun uh, and to taunt him further, um, we have invited a special guest uh, named Brian Cook, um, and we will we'll talk about the slides in a minute and talk about what the show's about uh, in a minute. Um, but uh, Brian, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us uh, what you're because I, I can never remember anyone's titles at Red Hat anymore because like every, you know, like three months they change. So, you know, I always like people to introduce themselves. Sure. Hey, I'm Brian Cook. I'm a product manager here at Red Hat. I work um, on an internal product that we call the Container Factory. It's actually kind of a big coalition of people inside Red Hat who um, work for many different teams and work to make all the machinery that produces all of our containers and operators and all the stuff that has to go along with building and shipping those um, work. And it's actually quite a large group of people. Um, it's an amazing group of people. Um, and the fact that sort of it's a, uh, a cooperative and not a, a forced function that makes it a kind of an interesting thing here. Nice. Um, and so why, uh, and so some of your work leaks into the outside is basically what it goes on? It, I'm sorry, it leaks what? Into the outside versus just being an internal project. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have a lot of code that um, we push outside, and we're actually making even more efforts as we um, change things. So, yeah, a lot of our efforts become um, open source kind of upstreamy things, and some of them get included into products or things like that. Yeah. I gotcha. Uh, cool. Uh, so why don't we, I'll do the, my ugly, ugly slides. Um, it's uh, still bothering me that I can't seem to get into the Twitch live stream to watch the chat. Um, but I think I finally figured it out. So now it should be better. Uh, but I get no history on chat. So if we missed anything, uh, please let us know. Um, so let's see, technology, try not to defeat me for a minute. Uh, and oops, <clears throat> it's defeating me. Here we go. Oh, hey, guess what? We're going to share on Wayland and uh, things are going to be not as uh, useful. First time um, sharing on a new laptop. Yeah, exactly. My uh, my laptop wouldn't boot this morning, so that was fun. Um, I suspect it ran out of disk because I was doing an upgrade over the weekend. Um, and... None of these desktops that it's presenting me look like the desktop that I want to share. Um, this is super weird. Oh, well, let me just uh, try this and try this. Wow, we're really uh, firing on all cylinders today. It's an uh, uh, ominous start to a Wednesday morning. <laughs> Exactly. All right. So you should be able to see the slides now, even though the aspect ratio and the sizing and all that jazz is probably off. Um, but long story short, uh, here is the level up hour. Normally we talk about containers and so containers we can do. Uh, apparently, uh, you know, streaming, booting, all those things are, are uh, out of my wheelhouse. So, um, hey, Lingdon, it's sharing your whole desktop. So you might want to maximize that window. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Uh, all right. It's not too, it's very, very big for me now. Um, 
So, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is the level of power. And <laughs> today, uh, as, as talked, uh, discussed a minute ago, um, I'm Langdon White, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Langdon with a one. Um, and Chris is not here today, uh, so uh, we have crossed him out in in uh, in a particularly harsh manner, um, and and invite uh, Mr. Sullivan in his stead, uh, who you can find on Twitter at Practical Andrew. Um, so uh, join us there. You can obviously still talk to Chris Short. He will be back next week. Um, and, uh, you know, all the better for it, I'm sure. And uh, you can also find us on our Discord. Uh, and there is the link there. Um, let's see. Can I use the magic uh, uh, Twitch? Let's see if it works for me. Uh, no, I have to be logged in, um, which I am currently not. So uh, you will have to type in the link yourself or maybe somebody else can share it if they feel like typing. Uh, so. Yeah. All right. Still trying to calm down from my panic attacks this morning. Uh, so you can find out more information about the Level Up uh, program in general, which, as we talk about, uh, offers <clears throat> some free training and low and like uh, cost reduced training, as well as licenses to OpenShift. Uh, if you want, if you go to that URL, uh, you can check it out. And today we're going to talk about the Container Health Index, which I f find particularly interesting, and I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of. Um, as we usually do, uh, we have show notes from last time, which uh, you can find at that link there. And I think that one I actually managed to uh, prepare in advance, but I don't know if it's going to let me. So let me chat it all if I'm not logged in. No, it does not. Hold on. I have to log in. Um, so. Oh, good gracious. Now I have to TFA. 2FA. Uh, so. Um, Let's see, but why don't we get started and I will sort that out and give you links in a second. Um, and I think that's the last slide we wanna talk about for right now. Um, and this whale and sharing thing is gonna be fun for any kind of uh, uh, browser-based activities um, because- well, I'm not a lot better at dealing with white whaling lately, but- yeah, I didn't, uh, you know, actually, I, I just uh, had been talking to uh, some of the desktop team about just that. Um, and uh, I was I was actually really surprised that Firefox it wouldn't let me share it. I wonder with Chrome, if it would let me do it, um, you know, let me do two different versions or whatever. Uh, so let's talk about the Container Health Index, which... Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the goal is, uh, Brian, and uh, and then we can go kind of from there. Sure. So uh, as we all know, well, maybe we don't all know, I'll just say containers are immutable, right? Like uh, once you get one, it is what it is. Uh, you can theoretically create a new container from the original one, right? But then it's a different container, not the one you started with. So the, the container itself is immutable and... Um, Kind of our normal pattern for using them is like get one, use it for a while, and then um, throw it away and get another one from the source. Not not like uh, continue to <laughs> to patch the one you have, right? So we talk about like pets versus farm animals kind of uh, methodology with containers. <clears throat> and the the problem is like when do you know when to get a new one or like what what um, when you're Particularly if you if you use our ecosystem catalog to like look for images that you might want to use, like uh, how do you know like what the status of that image is? <clears throat> and the container health index was conceived a few years back as a way um, essentially to understand like the, the container's status with regards to available patches. And that's like a critical thing to understand because actually um, originally, the container health index wasn't called that. It was called the freshness grade. And it was um, it was meant to, to convey like, this isn't, you know, we're not trying to say uh, this container is safe, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, how new is it? How recently has it been updated? Um, and the container health index has grades, like sort of like school, except for the end of it gets a little weird. Like we never had ease. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've actually always wondered about that. Like, why? Why don't we have these? You know, what I don't is, know. Because I, is it because it collides with excellent? That's what I was. Yeah. That was my only theory. Um, Could be. I, I, I'm not sure. Or did, I, I thought maybe it was vowels, and then I realized they the vowels. So I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, 
so the deal is like um, we're we're trying to convey the message about the most important missing patches. And for us, that is um, the line is for important or critical, right? So CVEs have ratings, mm -hmm. rating system, and the top two are critical and important. After that, it goes to moderate. Most of the things that we rate as moderate are not, you know, um, super concerning to be running for a while on a production system. Um, while important and critical is the ones we think people should be focusing on the most. Uh, and so the container health index only deals with the lack of important and critical vulnerability. Um, there's a scale and I uh, shared a document if you guys want to put it on the screen. Oh, uh, the K sure. KB, KB article. Um, I was just container health index KB article. Yep. Sorry. Um, yeah, I got it. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Speaking of logins. Uh, so what I wanted to point out real quick was see if you notice over here on the screen that I'm sharing is that health index right here. That is what we're talking about, um, which may not be obvious. Um, okay, so let's make that a little bigger so people can read it. That's what you're talking about, right? No. No. Not that one. Oh, the main one? Sorry. Yeah, yep, main one. I am really firing all cylinders today. <laughs> I also can't seem to get my mouse from uh, the one screen to the other. That's why you see it popping up. Oh, look at that. Hey, that's really useful. I've never there found this before. So this is on the, uh, the, the public knowledge base. <clears throat> and this explains what the grades mean in detail, right? And it shows the, the grades there. So grade A no missing patches essentially like no mm -hmm. no missing critical or important cv patches uh and then you go down to grade b and this is when um the factors start affecting the grade and the factors is what kind of patches um critical or important and they affect it differently and how old the patch or the, you know how many days since that patch was released uh, and that's important right because like uh, the longer the fix is out there, or the longer the, the vulnerability is known, the more people take advantage of it, right? And so the same vulnerability will get a lower grade the longer it's been um, fixed. So mm -hmm. grade B, grade B like uh, is m missing critical or important security router, no missing critical flaws older than seven days, no missing important flaw um, older than 30 days. And then, you know, you guys can read, but um, as you go down, it's like, uh, it's older, older, older until you get to grade F, which is like, you're missing stuff. That's a year old. Right. Um, and, and this is, this is, uh, something you will find in our catalog for the simple fact that like we have support life cycles and when something goes end of life, we stop rebuilding. Right. So, um, right. if you go and look for like some super old, uh, image in the container catalog, like it, it will be graded F. It should be graded F. And we want you to know it's graded F. Don't use it. <laughs> well, is there is there a distinction between, you know, like a grade F because it's a grade F and a grade F because uh, nobody cares about this anymore? Like, like, or should there be in a sense? In the container catalog, there's also a, uh, a release category on that page. So if you want, you can flip back over to the, the, um, rel page or i actually linked a ubi8 page there which i had looked at earlier that i know there's a tag on that has a different grade uh, uh so there's there's a release the category and it should say <laughs> generally available if you know you're looking at something that is in its support life cycle okay all right um yeah let me uh you said ubi oh ubi is here we have used the ubi on the show many times ubi um, yeah i gave you a link in the doc to ubi yeah I'm yep trying failing but trying let's see if this is to the right place there you this go. is the one right yeah and so then... you should have a release category of generally available um oh here yeah i see it now and then you have your grade as a right but if you right. go to the top where that tag says latest yep and uh pick the tag that's two months old it's like 8.4 dash and a 
203 and a, and a this Epoch, one? which I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Yep. Gotcha. You'll see that that one is not an A, it's B, right? And if you click right. on the security tab there, you can see why it's a B. Right. Because it's missing that, uh, that important vulnerability. So, but if I need this 8.4203, plausibly, right, I could put a layered container over it and update this CVE, right? You could, but that latest tag that we were on before is already the has it, version. right? Right, yeah. right. But if I needed, like, if I was more like, if I needed like 8.3 or some weirdness like that for some dumb reason, um, yep. theoretically, I could overlay it and, <laughs> and apply those patches. Yes, um, you could you, know. you could do that. Yep. Obviously, there's some challenges with that, but it, you know, you you can. There are challenges with that, which uh, the point releases of RHEL are not supported after the next one is released and immediately. So, oh, that's true, right? Yeah, so <laughs> right. But if you're if you're playing the catch up game, um, yeah, you know, that's uh, it, it'll it'll bridge the gap while getting you know being able to defend you against some pretty major stuff um Correct. although you know nine times out of ten at least for me right the reason you can't upgrade is the same reason that is flawed right like like they're usually related and so that's going to be you know so you get a little stuck anyway no matter what you do um sure. but i gotcha um cool all right so what um you know, so, you know, do you have a lot of people kind of giving feedback on this? I mean, are people, are you hearing feedback from, you know, community, from, you know, customers or whatever about using this info? Yeah, I mean, we get, we get feedback. We, it's positive and negative, right? Um, the, the things to be, the, the negative feedback we get is all focused around um, some of the gotchas, right? And so, like, it's important to keep in mind, again, that grade A doesn't mean we're saying it's safe. It just means it doesn't have any outstanding patches that need to be applied, right? Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> um, right. Depending, we do, we have a, a, a very good security department who ranks the patches, but depending on how exactly you are using that container, a moderate, a moderate vulnerability, which doesn't factor into the health index at all, could be more important to your use case than we think it would generally be, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're, I, I would say we're pretty conservative on the security ranking, but it's not impossible, right? Um, another thing to keep in mind is that like there is a lag, a, there is some lag between when a patch becomes, uh, let's say like, a, like our vulnerability becomes known about and a patch becomes available, right? So the, the container health index is about uh, you're missing a patch. And so we drop the grade. So consider this scenario where uh, a critical, but not like embargoed, right? And I don't know if we need to explain that. Actually, yeah, let's, in. so embargoed, <laughs> right? So when when there is a secret patch, basically. Right. Um, These are the worst of the worst right. vulnerabilities, right? The super worst vulnerabilities uh, that, that you can think of, the ones that make news headlines, right? Um, like when those things are discovered, there's, you know, uh, typically somebody will say, I found this super egregious vulnerability and it's so bad, we're going to we're gonna keep it a secret until we actually release the fix. And so that's called right. an embargo. And it, but it's not, it's only a secret from the general public. Usually the security right. teams of a bunch of like the Linuxes, even the Windows people, like whatever, right. are often communicating about it. Um, and that's necessary. Just, yeah. Right. It's necessary essentially for global information security because the same, the same patch or the same CVE will, will typically affect many different operating systems, right? Mm -hmm. It can, it could affect, uh, it could affect Red Hat, you know. Rel and, and Fedora, it could affect Ubuntu, it could affect Windows. I mean, it could affect tons of stuff. And so, yeah, yeah all these companies have to work together to prepare their patches. And then, then there's an agreed upon release date where the vulnerability is disclosed. So, Brian, but, we, we've got a question uh, yeah. so from Playing Risky uh, about the security reports. Uh, sure. So, more or less, the question is, where, where does the... Where, where does that information come from? The 
the various uh, uh, security alerts that it's testing against. Um, so the specific or the precise question is, uh, is a security report integrated with Red Hat Arata and Claire, or where does that info come from? It is, it is integrated with Red Hat Arata and specifically the Oval streams, and it is using Claire to produce the list of vulnerabilities, yes. I um, put some resources in the doc late earlier because I assumed this question would come up and we would and we would probably trend in this direction. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for anybody who's going, what are you talking about? Uh, Oval is a uh, common um, syntax for describing vulnerabilities and fixes to those vulnerabilities. And uh, I have a link to the Oval KB article for yep. you guys, and also Just, a link to the rel eight oval files, so you can see what those things look like. Yeah, I'm not sure we want to look at a BZ two necessarily, but you know, now nah, you, you <laughs> send it, send it to them. Um, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I'll throw it in the uh, chat. Um, unless Andrew, you already beat me to it, but now I'm scrolled back. Oh look at that. Uh, oh, you got the article too. So. Um, yep. Yeah. So, um, and this is not like like oval is not a red hat thing right it's a no, it's no, no. yeah that's oval is an industry standard language right okay. for des describing cves and the available fixes to cves from different places um red hat provides oval feeds for its own products and for open source um open source uh distributions like ubi mm -hmm. uh and there are other oval feeds out there. If you go and like uh, search around on the NIST site, you'll find oval feeds for lots of other software as well. Yeah, I, it's actually, I was just kind of going back to the embargo thing too. Um, like, that's one of the weirdest things I think about having now, you know, kind of working in an operating system company, you know, which I am, you know, now and have been for quite some time. But before that, I never had, right? Is that like, I don't know about the two of you, but I often am aware that we have. X, Y, Z, like some number of embargoed patches yep. coming. I don't know when they're coming. I don't know what they actually are. I don't even usually know like how egregious they are. I just know in the ether somewhere, there's an embargoed patch that's actually happened a couple of weeks ago. Like the, that's, the And that's by patch. design, right? Like, right, uh, right. It, it is literally need to know even inside Red Hat. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am responsible responsible in part for most of the stuff that ships our containers and i am not informed when we have an embargo right <laughs> right embargo well and I, <laughs> I, I think that's what like i guess you know like kind of looking at it from the outside you know i kind of always assumed everybody at red hat knows and they just keep it no a secret way. you know but yeah. in fact yeah like next to no one knows <laughs> um you know it's basically the in fact on the development involved. team on the development teams, it's usually only develop only the developer that is writing the patch is the only person who knows what the actual issue is. Right, and not even their manager a lot of the time, which I right. think is particularly interesting. Um, you know, unless there's some, you know, a lot of times the the managers at Red Hat, particularly in engineering, tend to be like lead engineers as well. So there's a little bit of a you know can be a little bit of misnomer in that they they will often be consulting with the developer themselves about the patch um but yeah it's uh i i don't know i find it really interesting um and uh you know but they're and they're not even all that bad like i the one uh that was relatively recent i i remember i was a little surprised that it's uh cve rating so like there's ratings from uh whatever one to ten i guess or zero to ten um and this was and ten being the worst and this was like an eight and a half <clears throat> and it, yet it was embargoed um which you know that's that seemed at least to me a little low for an embargo level uh cve so it, it's a pretty rare event to do yeah. an embargo but it you know is, yeah if we it's only, eight and a half we usually process uh we only process maybe like two to four a year right you know right generally just a couple a year right when the TV. ssl guys are uh, doing their thing um but actually so, what i why i went down that rabbit hole i was i was saying imagine imagine an, uh, a vulnerability that is not embargoed like a critical vulnerability that's not embargoed okay mm -hmm. so so um the world knows about the vulnerability and there could be uh, a week or a couple weeks, you know, depends, but there's, there's some time gap between when the world knows about the vulnerability and when we ship an RPM that fixes the vulnerability. Right. Okay. And then there's some other time delta 
between when we ship the RPM and when the new container is respun that includes that RPM. Mm -hmm. So in the first time gap between when the vulnerability is disclosed and when we ship the patch, the container grade does not change because there is no available patch. Right, okay. Right? So even Remember though it's vulnerable grade, to it, yeah. The right. grade reflects the status of its outstanding patches. There is no patch. You know it's there, but there's no patch. So even though like it might be an important or critical vulnerability that container will still say A, then in the second time gap, um, there is a patch because an, an RPM has been shipped that, that comes with an RHSA. So that is the errata that the uh, questioner was asking about before, right? So we have shipped an errata, a Red Hat Security Advisory. Now a patch exists and that RHSA will be reflected in the oval feeds. Um, Claire would be triggered by that errata shipping to update the security tab. It's metadata behind the scenes, but what people see is the manifestation of that is that security tab in the catalog. You're gonna now see, okay, this thing is there. Um, and the grade would be impacted. So I think that's a that's an important distinction to make, right? Of it's not doing vulnerability scanning, it's doing patch checking. Correct. What Claire is currently doing is looking for missing patches. It's because it's using the the oval feeds that talk about what patches are available for installed containers. Right, but in the same way that um, you know, if I configure my HTTPD uh, container to be writable, uh, you know, or to have the you know the files writable uh, from the world, um, it's going to be pretty insecure. But there's really no right. like there's no scan for that per se, unless you get into like kind of straight yeah. security runtime scanning. scanning. Yeah, right, you can get right. into runtime scanning, and there are lots of companies that provide stuff like that. Um, but that's that's not what this is, right? This is a static, we'll call it static vulnerability uh, assessments. And that means, like, we don't know anything about how you're going to run it. We're just looking at the container itself. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, what what triggers a, a rescan of an existing container? Is it the release of new errata? Is it just a periodic? It happens every, you know, one, two, six, 12 hours. Yeah. So interestingly, the way Claire works and one of the things that's fantastic about it, we don't have to rescan the containers ever. Um, what Claire does is there is a database and when we produce a container, it's, it is scanned by Claire. And essentially what, what Claire is doing is, is creating an inventory of what's in the container. And it puts it in this um, Postgres database that kind of behaves like a graph. <clears throat> then when we ship an errata, to follow Langdon's example, um, say we ship an errata against HTTPD2, um, Claire gets notified by um, our message bus that we've shipped an errata and it gets information about like uh, what what vulnerability was shipped from oval right and basically we just kick it and say like there's new stuff just to be a little more proactive it would do it on its own anyway but um, we can kind of push it right mm -hmm. and so it will it will go get the updated oval feeds and inside that oval feed there will be information about the errata that was shipped for the package then it can look inside its database and see all the containers it's ever shipped with that package and the vulnerable versions that were patched. And it can immediately link the new errata to those affected containers. Um, so that, that takes care of Claire sort of knowing about the, the vulnerability. We have an extra step wrapped into ours in order to make the catalog and the container health index work, which is, um, we have a separate database that powers this ecosystem catalog view that we're looking at. And when Claire updates that information, it takes uh, a subset, kind of a summary subset of that, and it updates the catalog as well. So that is what um, finally sort of updates the security tab view and the container health index grade. Well, so kind of in a related way, um, do the containers in the container catalog ever get updated aside from a security patch or whatever um they do they do uh well they get updated because we push new features or release new versions of software right, right? So, so like 8.3 to 8.4 for example sure, sure. I, yep. I meant yep. more like um you know is there or <clears throat> or like 
okay, going back to, or maybe that is kind of the related thing. So going to, you know, whatever this, um, you know, these patches here, um, you know, 8.4, yeah. 199, whatever, uh, are these always security driven or are they feature driven as well? Although yeah, I guess there shouldn't be any features. Um, uh, okay, so there's a, do you see those tags that say, uh, let me, I, here's this really small, let me pull it up. <laughs> uh, so the tag we were looking at, this says like 8.4-203.1622-6601. Yeah. Yep. Um, whatever that crazy thing is, right? Yep. The part after that, um, the end of that string is an epoch, right? Mm -hmm. Like Unix time. Uh, and whenever you see those tags in the container catalog, you can immediately know that that was triggered by uh, us shipping a CVE. Because okay. we have an internal automation process called Freshmaker, and it is triggered by us shipping CVEs. And, Ralph being special, yes. Yep, yeah. Um, and it does a bunch of stuff now, but uh, Freshmaker essentially will be triggered by us shipping a CVE and queue up all these rebuilds and um, process them automatically to build new containers that include the newly shipped patches. Um, we gotcha. do have we do have tags like you'll see 8.4-199 and 8.4-203, right? Like mm -hmm. that is a that is an example of what you're asking about. That was that was a tag cut by the RHEL engineering team and, and released. For some reason, I can't I can't tell you exactly what the reason was. Um, it probably does include some like lower level, you know, like maybe some moderate security patches or something like that. Uh, maybe or bug API, fixes could be like API yeah. improvement or something. Yeah, right. right. You know, we remember the errata categories. We have uh, bugs, security vulnerabilities, and, and enhancements, right? Um, and so the fresh fresh maker only responds to uh, security vulnerabilities. Right. Okay. And that's kind of what Rel, I was getting at. But Relinge teams on a release cadence where they'll they'll hit their release cadence and they'll cut a new ver like a new container with all the updated Rel stuff in it that's not security related as well. So yes, you do get those um, inside of like point releases, and you can tell the difference by looking for those epoch stamps on the on the tag. And just just to be clear, once a container is pushed, it's no longer changed, right? So if effectively over time, it slowly marches downwards in grades Correct. as more releases or more errata is released against it. So if yes. today I pick a specific tag and it's an A, next week there might be errata that degrades it to a B and then the following week a C and the following week a D and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, so I just, I just plopped over to 8.0, right? And right. it has a nice, nice fat F right there. Yeah. And right. that's exactly what it should have, right? Right. So by, <laughs> by way of example, and I guess kind of going to the other point I was talking about there, it was like, but so nothing there, there's only, it's kind of like running um, DNF or yum, you know, kind of the auto updates, right? Like on your laptop or whatever, is that it only automatically rebuilds for security uh, reasons. Um, feature reasons are always driven by a human um, you know, or at least in the large majority. I mean, obviously some engineering team may have some automation that says whenever they do a release, it, it goes out. Um, but long story, like the, as far as the infrastructure is concerned for, you know, kind of the catalog, um, the only time you see releases that are, or the only releases that are automatic are ones that are done by, uh, because of a security uh, update, essentially. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the reason I was asking is just um, there's no, I don't know, I'm just going to make up a day here, right? But like there's no weekly update that's automatically going through and like rebuilding everything. Um, no. And so they're event driven. At, right. Okay. So, so as a consumer, I can also be event driven in a sense. I don't need to go and pull how often the container is changing. I can, I can feed off of the errata or whatever myself as well. Yeah. In fact, there are a couple ways that you can, you can sort of be more proactive about that without you literally having to go look at the grid. Mm -hmm. um, one is in the container catalog, you can sign up for a vulnerability um, for RHSA notifications for the images that you're interested in. Um, Oh really? Where's okay. that? Okay. 
I don't have the link in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, ask the difficult questions. Yeah, uh, uh, we can we can post it later. But yeah, there's a way to sign up for RHSA notifications. But this, uh, huh. trust me, trust me from experience, because when they rolled this feature out, somebody decided to sign me up for all of them. <laughs> uh, this is not scalable. So if you are a heavy container right. user, you don't want this feature. <laughs> right, right. Um, or at least you don't want it going to your to a, a human red email address. Right. right. The the, be the better thing to know is that if you're using OpenShift, um, if your image streams are based on tags, mm -hmm. then there are these floating tags inside the container catalog that you're going to want to use. Right. So if you if you look down uh, at the tag drop down again on like the row the UBI eight that we were looking at. Yep. Um, there are there are these blue bubbles around some of the tags. And those are what we call floating tags. Those are tags that get moved. Um, when a new image is produced, that tag moves. So latest always points at the latest uh, floating tag, right? Mm -hmm. Or at the, at, at the latest container, sorry, in, container, in yeah. that repository. Um, 8.4 is, is going to point at the latest release of 8.4 in that repository. Um, you could choose to use either one of those um, when you're doing like referencing a, a build or something like that in OpenShift, and you will continue to get um, like updated images all the time. You have to be aware that if you use the 8.4 tag, which I do not recommend, um, at some point it will become deprecated. Literally the day after 8.5 ships, it will be deprecated. Well, this um, is and the... from, from there, it will, it will start to decline. The, the health index will start to decline, right? So for, for things like a, a UBI 8 image, you would you would generally want to use latest because that's going to be compatible throughout its lifespan. Other repositories that might not be the same, right? There, um, there are also these things we call multi-stream repos. And then an, an example of a multi-stream repo would be like if we squished the UBI seven and eight repos together, and mm -hmm. we had like we had like a UBI seven tag and a UBI eight tag, and you would want to pick one of those depending on which one you wanted. We have. UBI is not like that, but we have other repositories that are like that. And choosing the right floating tag actually gets you a different major version of software. Right. So it's good right. to always look inside that that drop down and see what the situation looks like in there with floating tags. Right. Yeah. I'm always on the fence about um, you know what to choose here, right? Because so um you know, as, as a, you know, a many year developer and to some, you know, and I've played, you know, I joke around about, I've played an administrator on TV. Um, I, I don't like things changing underneath me. Right. So in that argument and in kind of in the container immutable world, I don't like things changing underneath me without kind of being aware of it. Um, and so in that world, I want to choose the the sticky version that is not a floating tag, right? I want to know exactly what I'm getting. The yeah. thing is, is that when I, you know, I say that, but then at the same time, uh, this is kind of where, you know, do you, do you trust your vendor in a sense? Um, and, you know, Red Hat in particular is pretty good about uh, not, shipping backwards breakable changes uh and or you know and certainly makes promises about that it's a bug or whatever but you know wh whether it's i can treat that as a bug and file a ticket and get that fixed or whatever doesn't keep me from having an outage you know um yeah. so so i'm always on the fence there but i think this goes back to a little bit where it's kind <clears> of <throat> like you want to choose your tags and how what you follow automatically somewhat based on the provider of the content um, you know, I would actually say that you, you <laughs> should really think about what your use case is when you're choosing those tags. The best right, case right. scenario is you choose the tag that keeps you up to date automatically, right? Because right. if you don't choose that, then you have to do something and we all get busy and forget. And right. then now you have this super out of date image sitting there. So what we should think about is in what circumstances could the changes between versions of RHEL cause me problems, okay? Um, the, the binary compatibility between rel point releases is extremely good but mm -hmm. if i was going to worry about it it would be in the case that i'm doing something like uh running low level c programs that interface with operating system you know potentially like you know pretty low level parts of the operating system or mm -hmm. if i'm using hardware access if i'm doing uh things like using 
AI accelerator hardware, like machine learning accelerator hardware directly from a container, um, you know, drivers and things like that. That's when I might say, hey, I, I might run this through a test environment. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of the container use cases we see um, are using things like Java and Python, which are interpreted languages, are running business logic, which does not care anything about the underlying hardware. Code's not even compiled, it's interpreted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I can say that um, in about four years of running a pretty wide fleet of Python apps um, using, the, using the latest tag with RHEL containers, I've never had a problem with RHEL updating. Right, the only problem right. I, the only problem I had with all the apps in all those years was one time when SQL Alchemy decided to update to a new major version of SQL Alchemy and it broke some stuff and we ended up pinning it to uh, the previous version and that's it so uh, it's really it's really quite safe it, 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 it is a it is a double-edged sword right like you right. can literally free yourself from patching cycles <laughs> in large part. Uh, which we all would like to do. So, so well, can, uh, can I? Uh, just, sorry, yeah, I was going to go ahead and ask the ask your question. I just wanted to ask, and I think in coinciding with that, but also jumping back a little, it sounded like you said that the UBI images are only updated for errata patches. And no, that's not. No, no, that's okay. not true. So uh, the, it, the errata patches are updated. the ones with the e yeah. epoch stamps. The ones without the epoch stamps are our our manual releases cut by the rel team to provide something. Got it. So is is there a scenario where when you're building your container you would want to do like a DNF update dash y or something like that? Um, was more or less my question. Um, you can do that. Is there a situation where you would want to do that? Um, I, I think the short answer is no. Yeah. It's it going to be like a no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a really weird use case. It does happen. It, it's um, weird, but yeah, it's not like I mean the uh, I've actually I've done it a little bit with if you have something that like you are relying on a very very new thing then I have to do a DNF update because I need to get something that's later than the latest rel eight, four, whatever image that's been shipped. But yeah. like, generally speaking, if you're doing that, you're probably doing something wrong or you're it's not necessarily even wrong um, to Brian's point earlier, right? Backwards compatible changes or incompatible changes are pretty rare. And so it probably won't hurt you in fact, but yeah. it's probably also not valuable. Um, I would say it's another one where um, I would say generally the answer, the general answer to this is you should probably not do it. Um, if you know a whole lot about, you know, your specific runtime uh, situation and you know, maybe there's some like moderate patch or a bug fix that you really need uh, that isn't available yet. It, it is doable. The, right. the downside to doing this is like a blanket policy across everything is that um, sometimes RPMs need tweaks or um, some kind of modification in order to run properly in a container, particularly the kind of containers that we build for OpenShift, where uh, we have to assume that they're being used by an arbitrary user ID and that they're running inside of like the security context constraint jail, right? And the general RPM available for Red Hat Enterprise Linux or UBI, and installing into the container, in I would say this is not the rule, but in certain cases, it will produce a different result than the one in the container, and it will not run the same as the one we ship in the container, because there's some like extra configuration tweak being done to make that run properly inside the security context constraints. Um, oh yeah. So, that's interesting. So if you if you were going to do that, you would have to test it ahead of time. Make sure everything worked the way you thought it was going to work. And I would only do it if you had a real good reason to do it, because it could certainly cause some issues. Yeah. Well, and kind of going back to the earlier point um, and related to this one, too, is like 
where you're doing those kinds of things. So, you know, as you were kind of giving the example, you know, you're doing machine learning, uh, you know, that's leveraging the driver coming out of the container, you know, and you're doing something really weird to it or whatever. And so you don't want to kind of take those automatic updates. That's those are the places where it's really important to invest in automated testing. And then yep. you do take the updates, you take those automatic updates, yes. but you're testing does the, you know, does it run through or whatever um, and before it actually gets deployed. So even yep. if you don't feel like you can put the effort into a full like CI, CD kind of infrastructure, um, what you can do is say, okay, I have these, they're, you know, they're, they're grade A, you know, triple A apps, right? They have, um, you know, they're mission critical for whatever reason. They are um, also highly, you know, uh, volatile, right? They're really close to the operating system or they're really close to the tools in the operating system. Maybe focus your energy on automated testing and automated release cycles and that kind of stuff on those components and it's probably you know it'll probably be less effort and money and all that other jazz than you know doing your whole infrastructure but at least it will cover the broad you know the the worst cases in a sense so uh, uh two things um so one uh just a five minute warning just oh okay. yeah, yeah yeah and uh two we do have a question from murph uh so what is the process or what process does engineering go through after a Red Hat security advisory is released for an application? Uh, I noticed that it does take longer for an image to be updated with the patch for the vulnerability versus what's already available via the software package. Uh, so I assume he means it takes longer to get the container image than it takes to get the RPM. Uh, okay. And that is because that's because the container image actually has to wait to be built for the RPM to become available. So um, the RPM is actually the fix that we're applying to the container. So and, it'll, it'll always follow. And is there, I, I think it's more like, what's the timeline? And is that an extended timeline? Uh, it depends on the criticality rating of the CV. Generally, um, with a important or critical vulnerability, um, we will we will essentially have, we have to wait for the RPM to, come, to become available. So that's up to rel engineering to create, you know, create a fix and package it and test it on rel, um, te go through all that testing for the package and then push it in the RPM repo. When it's pushed into the RPM repo, um, there is a bit of metadata that goes with it called an RHSA, a Red Hat Security Advisory. You can actually see those on the website. Um, they say, you know, if you search for the CVE, CVE-2021, you know, blah, 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 there's a number. Um, there will be an R a corresponding RHSA for that CVE when a fix is shipped. The shipping of the metadata, the RHSA, is what triggers our rebuilds. Um, and so for, for like important or criticals, for example, Freshmakers should pick those up and rebuild them pretty quickly. Um, if, if it's a CVE that affects our entire portfolio, then, and, and a lot of times when there's a critical rel vulnerability, like you can imagine the, the stack of software, right? If a critical vulnerability comes out for rel, then, or, or UBI, then, then everything else we build is on rel, which means literally every container in our, every repo in our container catalog needs a new image. And so what happens in that case is that Freshmaker basically goes and queues up a zillion builds, and then we have to start working down against that queue. Um, and so it can take uh, a little while, but it usually doesn't take more than a day or two, I would say. Yeah, and obviously the, um... The ones that are lower in the stack will show up before the ones that are higher in the stack. So, so a UBI right. eight, you know, update yeah. should land before you know an HTTP yes. one. Yeah. So if you can imagine that you're using, um, let's. I'm I'm going to try and think of it. This might be a contrived example because I don't exactly know how this build, but follow my example. If you can imagine you're using an open stack Cinder container from us, right? then when the RPM ships, UBI 8 needs to rebuild. And when UBI 8 uh, ships, then we can rebuild Python 3.6 on UBI 8. And when Python 3.6 is done rebuilding, 
then we can rebuild OpenShift Cinder uh, container because it requires that, right? So actually, FreshMaker, while it sounds like a uh, little, you know, simple program that just goes, I need to rebuild all these things. It actually has a bunch of internal dependency logic that before it can start rebuilding, it actually sorts out in what order everything actually has to be rebuilt. And that's actually the trickier part of just building this stuff is figuring out what order everything has to be rebuilt in. And so, yes, if you're using UBI 8, that's going to happen really fast. And if you're using something that's like way up at the top of the stack, that's going to take longer because all the things below it have to get shipped first. It also... Um... Because, uh, like I said, uh, Ralph being special. Um, so if you if you are unfamiliar with his work, he's done a lot of really good pieces of software. But it, the other thing that you have to do is once you do the dependency graph, then you also have to um, collapse the combinatorial explosion <clears throat> so that you're only actually, you know, so you want to so you not only do figure out all the things that have to be rebuilt, but then try to figure out how to make it so you only rebuild each individual thing once. Um, and so it is a it is a challenging problem. Um, yeah. So let's and Freshmaker has, oh, Fresh has a yeah. team around it. Freshmaker has a team around it now, and uh, Ralph is our. Um, so, so the the org we used to call DevOps, which would mean more stuff to our audience, and yeah. uh, we call it EXD now. But uh, Ralph is the EXD cloud architect, and and we have a team that maintains FreshMaker and is constantly upgrading its capabilities. Um, they've recently been working on uh, making it able to do automatic rebuilds of operators as well, so that um, when like an operand image gets rebuilt by FreshMaker due to a CVE, it can actually find the controller and bundle images and uh, update the references there and reship a new version of the operator that includes a patched operand reference. Yeah, and sorry, to be clear, I don't know that he, uh, he may have written some of the code, but I, it was he his did. name. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was his name of the, the yeah, app. Yeah, no, he That's started why. that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when he and I were working on modularity originally, we were, yep. uh, we uh, had to name off a piece of the infrastructure as well and uh, that we couldn't really talk about or whatever, but it was, uh, we ended up just calling it pixie dust. Uh, this is where the pixie dust happens. Um, Freshmaker was not in that bucket um, and, uh, but it's, but kind of was. So uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. So uh, let's pause there for a second. Uh, let's do, uh, let's see if I can just reuse the same window if i can get my sizing good here um but we can pause for some sweet sweet internet points um which i'm not sure if brian is familiar with uh but nope we uh if we uh give out some sweet sweet internet points for coming to watch the show or participating in the uh the repos and stuff and then we talk about who has won or who's the leaders in the sweet sweet internet points uh, right now, we are up to 5,700 points for Narendev, and uh, Netherlands Hackam uh, is how we pronounce that, at 5,400 points, um, and no friction, and Joe Fuzz still holding still at 4,000 and 2,300, respectively. Uh, Detective Konakudo and Bacon Fork steadily rising up through the ranks, um, and <clears throat> if I can find my, uh, my G-Edit file, not my notepad, but my notepad... Um, I have links to where you can get points for today's episode. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of our current status on the points. Thanks everyone, as always, for participating. Uh, we really appreciate it. We uh, have closer promises on uh, my, our running joke of uh, while we understand how important the intrinsic reward of getting enough internet points is to everyone, uh, we're hopeful that the extrinsic rewards are going to land soon. And some of the leaders may have already received some extrinsic awards uh, already kind of sort of um but we have um uh we should be able to make more stuff available very very soon now uh yeah it's kind of driving me nuts uh so there is our sweet sweet internet points um and uh, yeah, so the rewards uh, are very likely. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say exactly, but um, basically, 
the idea of the rewards is going to be kind of like acts, you know, kind of for lack of a better term, gift certificates to the brand new cool stuff store. Uh, but we've had so many challenges. I think this is like our third brand new cool stuff store in the life of the show. Um, like, so that's been a huge challenge. And then T's and C's. Oh, and then there was a pandemic. If anybody caught that on the news. Um, so like, it's just been like one thing after another uh, trying to make these things happen. Uh, so, but, we think we're very, very close. Uh, so tick tock, tick tock. Um, so from here, I did want to say, um, you know, Brian, did, it, what is kind of the future here? What's what do you think is the next big step for the health index or for for like keeping, you know, keeping our our containers fresh and and, you know, safe? So on the building side, like I said, uh, the Freshmaker team's working on automatic rebuilds of operators. That's about done, probably in a matter of weeks, it'll be in production. Oh, nice. On the, on the data side, um, <clears throat> the, the different team, the team that works on, uh, we have two different teams that work on Claire. We have an upstream team and we have an internal team. The internal team works with, um, with my folks and we are the ones that make, uh, make sure Claire is able to use all the Red Hat data sources. And we're constantly thinking of new ways to work with security to produce new data and have Claire consume that data to produce useful information for folks. So um, the next thing you're gonna see on that front is that the container catalog on that vulnerabilities tab will start showing um, data about unpatched vulnerabilities. It still won't affect the grade, but you will be able to see all the, um, all the vulnerabilities that are in the container that don't have a fix available as well as the ones that do have a fix available. Cool. Okay. So, so kind of like that, we were talking about those two windows earlier, the window of yep. you know, CVE has been released, but patch hasn't been released yet. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, so that'd be good. Um, <clears throat> From there, we, uh, we're going to start looking into grading and uh, vulnerability assessment. We're already looking into it, but uh, like we will, we will start producing oval feeds first with security that um, in regards to non RPM content that's shipped. Mm -hmm. Um as we move, you know, further and further into container space, it's like there are, um, we start to see packages that we just uh, never shipped as an RPM and they only get shipped in containers, you know, and we call that container first content, meaning that we didn't produce an RPM and install it in the container. It's just, there's content right into the container. Oh, right. Um, yeah. And we will have, we will have direct oval files uh, available that describe that content that are mm -hmm. slightly different than the RPM content. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's similar in mechanism, right, to the challenge that we have with building like Java things for Windows, like JBoss, um, yeah. you know, so so sometimes we produce content that is not in RPMs um, and, you know, containers are kind of the latest iteration of, of that. Um, yep. We're working on formalizing how that works internally, you know, for a very long time, 15, 20 years, uh, everything has been focused on the RPM being the unit of software that gets shipped, right? Um, RPM is the thing we ship. RPM is the thing we version. RPM is the thing we update. RPM is the thing we provide source for. Uh, you know, like everything was focused on RPM. And when we look at the container ecosystem, we've actually had to um, start to figure out how to reorient a lot of those processes around containers. Um, right. For example, for example, when we ship containers, uh, we want to be able to ship all the source for that container as a unit instead of you having to go and figure out like, okay, how do I find, you know, the source for 172 RPMs? Right, right. So we have this, we have this whole engine that we built inside Container Factory that um, produces source containers. So if you go find a, uh, an image on the container catalog, um, you can actually find the source container for that image as well in a lot of cases, increasing all the time, how many of them are available. Um, and you can pull a container which has all the source available. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, is it click on the Click on the click on the get this image tab. And yeah, here right, it is. You'll see get the source. Yeah, I was like, I knew I'd seen it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I think is really cool, right? Because I mean, you know, it, like this is one of those, there's all these, uh, 
you know, kind of things that are ancillary to open source, right? It's like open source source is available. You can fix any problems you have. Well, except you can't, right? Because right. you you don't have enough context. You don't know how to do a rebuild. You know, you don't know how whatever. I mean, I think one of the things that I really appreciate about Red Hat a lot of the time is, you know, for the vast majority of cases, we follow the spirit of the thing rather than the law of the thing or the the you know literal of the thing you know so we don't we generally speaking don't just release source code we generally release kind of enough to get you where you want to get to with the source code i don't know um but i think we do that with a lot of things and it's something i appreciate um cool so is are you know like are you getting feedback on this stuff is this stuff you want more you know community participation in you know is there does the upstream have the same goals as we do for the container health index in a sense uh we're the i'd say the upstream and our internal are converging so um the backstory here is that claire was originally developed by core os mm -hmm. and uh you know core os was a, bought by red hat and when we purchased CoreOS, it did not have very good ability to do vulnerability detection for RHEL. Uh, there was a CentOS plugin, however, it um, it didn't work. It didn't work very reliably, and it uh, used it produced a lot of false positives. Um, so at that point, like two different streams sort of happened. So that, like I said, there's an OpenShift engineering related team that that works on upstream Claire and um, kind of is concerned with the future of Claire and how it integrates into Quay registry and things like that. Then we have a um, an internal EXD DevOps team who works with the container factory. And we I started that team off to the side because I knew that we would need to have somebody who was more focused on making Claire's uh, plugins, which are not plugins anymore, but at the time they were plugins. But making Claire's ability to work directly with Red Hat content to be like the best, right? We wanted to make, my goal was to make Claire into like essentially the reference implementation for security scanning for RHEL. Um, we don't sell Claire at the moment. We don't have a subscription. You can't get a supported version of it. Um, but what we have now is uh, there's a security scanning certification program run by our partner team. And there's uh, some links to that in the doc that I gave you. And um, our internal version of Claire is used to provide the, um, the vulnerability data in the container catalog. A wrapper around it is used to produce the grades. And the data from it is also used as the reference data for um, benchmarking how well other security scanners are using our oval data to identify vulnerabilities, to make sure that there are not false positives, to make sure there are not false negatives, both, right? Right. Um, we have always had a history of having lots of false positive problems in RHEL with external security scanners because of our backporting practices, right? Right. So uh, we, we have to ship some certain version of Python forever and ever and ever uh, because what, that's what we baked into the operating system. We're going to support it for six, eight, 10 years, depending on the version of RHEL you're using. Um, and so it, when a patch comes, there's an upstream patch in a newer version of Python, but we have to backport that patch to the version that we've committed to support forever, right? And a lot of security scanners will just take a version, um, like a version, a, number a version yeah. comparison and say, oh, the one in RHEL is less than the one upstream where the fix is, so it must be vulnerable. But what they didn't do is they didn't look inside our oval files and see that we backported the fix for the patch to some version, right? right? That's, that's layer like layer one of where the confusion comes. And then with rel modularity, which you know something about, um, yeah, that yeah. actually kind of becomes even more problematic because inside the, the operating system might be multiple versions of the th same thing that got shipped. And um, even for people using the oval files, uh, it gets it tricky. You have to, you have to be very like, specific about making sure you're looking at the patch stream for the right modularity component Right. Right. Because there right. can be like multiple moving streams. Right. Um, and that was actually something that even caught us off guard when RHEL 8 shipped and we took us a, a month or so to, to um, get it fixed because we actually had to enhance the oval data stream to include more information than it was currently carrying and then go back and amend the Claire um, data consumer uh, part so that it could pull that data and use it to 
uh, figure out which part of the rel modularity uh, packages were vulnerable and which ones were not. So, 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 you know, it can be complicated. And our goal is one, to make sure that we never have surprises like that modularity thing, or at least that if we do, we know about them, right? Right. And that right. we know how to fix them. We know how, we know what data we need to add to the oval streams. And that by doing it, we learn how to teach other companies who are doing this. We, we can teach them how to do it. We can provide test case containers, benchmarks for them to use to, to, to figure out if their product is working right. Um, mm -hmm. And that's all what that security scanning uh, certification program is about. Right. Okay. So, so in a sense, right, it's, it's not even, it, it's as you say, right, it's mo almost more of a reference implementation. And yep. yeah, we're going to provide, you know, some of that information. But, you know, there's a whole field out there of companies that we don't really want to compete with. We just yep. want them to um, look at our stuff and be <clears throat> accurate, right? Um, yep. And so that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, the landscape's changing a little bit, and I can't comment much on this because I don't know. But like, we bought StackRox, and StackRox mm -hmm. is so is a security product. So there's we have some some overlap in that space now, and and actually StackRox has some components built on top of Clear as well. Mm -hmm. um, so all this work finds its way upstream and finds its way over to StackRox too. But uh, right, but right, but from for for my part in this, my my team is focused on uh, making Clear be absolutely bulletproof in being able to identify you know missing patches and vulnerabilities in rel shipped content the upstream right. team does a lot of different stuff they work on um, integrations with quay they work like they they look at how to identify vulnerabilities across different uh, uh distributions they they can identify vulnerabilities in ubuntu and they look at like upstream python packages and things like that mm -hmm. my team is focused only on rel content and making sure that that is like airtight I gotcha. I gotcha. Uh, so we should probably wrap it up here. We're a little bit over time, uh, as we often are. Um, but, uh, you know, thanks so much for coming, Brian. Uh, if we have any further questions or, you know, they come up or whatever, uh, we will maybe have you back or we will try to yeah, ask them individually. Um, as you keep referencing, we have some kind of notes of links and that kind of stuff. As usual, I'll dump those in the further reading section of the show notes for this show. So if you're interested in any of that content or, you know, or want to follow up, you know, everything we kind of mentioned in the chat, we'll also put there. Uh, so I will be putting a link up to that when I'm done with it at the next episode. Uh, usually I tweet out when they're done um, because it'll happen sometime between now and then. Uh, and uh, But thanks so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Langdon. Yeah. And uh, Andrew, thank you for being my uh, co-host again and uh, minding the chat, especially given our challenges with all of the things. Um, and uh, I think that's uh, that's it for the show today. Well, cheers.